Welcome back to this podcast called Mind Fit by Robert Aceves and Neil Babins. How are you doing, Neil? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I'm really excited for today's podcast. Um, we've had really good um, people calling us, sending us messages, and you know the response has been great. So I'm really, really excited to start one more podcast. Yeah. How are you today? <laughs> I'm really good. I had a nice weekend. I was down in San Diego. It was very relaxing. I had a Great host, show me around. It was wonderful. So that's awesome. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Long trip, two hours. <laughs> well, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to talk about um, cognitive distortions, things that happen in our mind automatically, or you know, automatic thoughts that we get every day, that sometimes are not helpful and they actually hinder our um, advancement in life and improvement. So. Um, I think it's one of our favorite subjects, right? We were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? Well, cognitive distortions, people have heard of this a lot. It's uh, under the family of the CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, mm -hmm. branch. Mm -hmm. um, cognitive distortions are basically irrational thoughts that we have, automatic thoughts, or patterns of thinking that we have that we don't really always necessarily realize that we have. Um, that we react and respond to based on having had them without an awareness that that's what was going on in our minds. And so it leads to our automatic thoughts are just things that pop in and have no filter and have no, um, you know, they have, they, they have no way of, uh, of, of switching unless we switch them, basically. So they lead, a thought leads to a feeling, a feeling leads to a uh, behavior or action. Behavior or action that we do leads to a consequence or an outcome. And then the outcome sort of gathers evidence for something that we fundamentally believe about ourselves or about the world, comes all the way back around, like in a loop, and that leads to automatic thoughts again. So if something happens to us, for example, someone honks, us, honks at us on the freeway, which never happens in LA. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> if someone honks at us, we automatically think something. Um, obviously, we check to see if everything's safe, but we automatically have an assumption that something that something is wrong. Like that person was uh, upset with me, or that person is, um, you know, chastising me, or something like that. Or, um, you know, I'm not likable, or I'm, I'm doing something wrong, or that person's doing something wrong. It's an automatic thought that we have that we've just screwed up somehow. You know what I mean? That we've just like messed up somehow, and. Um, the truth is, if we really look at the situation, there could be a number of different things that we're doing. Uh, one example of a cognitive distortion is one called mental filtering. Mental filtering is cognitive distortion. We tend to filter things out, out of our conscious awareness, the things that are not working. Things that, are, things that are not working become more pervasive and things that are working become less pervasive. We minimize them. So the tendency to focus on negative events while neglecting the positives. So... You might say to myself, you know, I'd say to yourself, I hate driving in LA after that incident. Somebody honked at you. But how many times have you driven home and you haven't been honked at? How many times have you driven home, there's been traffic, and you've been thinking about something else entirely, and your drive home was actually smooth, but you didn't notice your drive home being smooth. You just noticed whatever else you were thinking about. Only when someone honks or, or cuts in front of you or you're bumper to bumper, you know, do you actually notice how much you hate traffic and how much you have to get out of the city and how much you, you know, always make bad choices with traffic and how other drivers are rude, you know, or how that you can't manage yourself, you have too much anxiety to drive, you know, that kind of a thing. So we filter out what's not working and we filter out what is working rather and we filter in what is what's what's not working and we sort of amplify that in our minds. And that leads to a feeling. We feel frustrated, we feel angry, we feel fearful. That leads to a behavior. I'm never driving on the 405 again, <laughs> you know, and that leads to an outcome. Well, I takes me a long time to get home. So uh, ev the gathers evidence that I'm not a very good driver. I'm not very efficient on the streets. I'm not very good living in a big city, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And leads back to a core belief. There must be something fundamentally wrong with me. I need to move to the country, you know, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's just sort of a loop we get into. And sometimes it's accurate and sometimes it's not. It depends on how... We're thinking. Mental filtering is just one idea. Another one is um, jumping to conclusions, the tendency to make irrational assumptions about people and circumstances. Same thing. The person who honked at you, obviously he's rude. Well, maybe not. Maybe he's having a bad day. You know, maybe he was scared. Maybe he thought he saw something that he didn't see. Maybe he saw he thought he saw a dog run in front of your car. Who knows what we what's going on with with ourselves and others. But we jump to conclusions and it's an automatic thought. We automatic think, automatically think about something in a certain specific way, leads to a feeling about that, and then leads to a behavior that we take, and the behavior leads to an outcome, which is like a pattern, and it stems right back to our, our automatic thoughts happening again. So it's like, a, like a, in a cycle. So 
those are just two examples. Mental, mental filtering and jumping to conclusions are two very common ones. And um, yeah, I think we do that all the time. I know that I do that all the time until I catch myself doing it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's also important to see that this could be in any part of our lives, you know? We could have um, ways of thinking in our love life, for example, where we're constantly feeling like a failure in, in our relationships. But then in business, we, you know, we tend to feel like a successful person and we may do things differently. And therefore, you know, the result is different when we're, you know, doing business versus when we're in a relationship. And so this is, this is, you know, I guess you could say that it's, it's a way of sabotaging ourselves like we talked about in our previous podcast mm -hmm. but this is more like cognitively sabotaging right like mm -hmm. for example when we you know another one is when we uh, feel like uh, what we call personalization where we have the tendency to take the blame for absolutely everything that goes wrong in our life mm -hmm. when you know it's not always the truth sometimes it's our fault but sometimes or most of the time actually is not our fault is there are things in the environment that we cannot control and we take the blame for things like that and there's some people who even blame themselves for, themselves for the environment the the weather you know right right or if something doesn't go right it must have been something to do with with them it must be something to do with you when there are so many other factors and not necessarily about blame just in, in terms of accountability or what went into the equation that you know um, had things turn out that way but we tend to take everything personally that's that's one that's distortion for sure another one very big one is black and white thinking and we see this a lot oh um, yeah you know, <laughs> Yeah, how many different ways could other people interpret this? In other words, there's um, the tendency to see things as all or nothing. Things are either good or bad, right or wrong. They're either all good or all bad or right or wrong. There's one way to look at things. So if um, there was a mishap, you know, during an event, um, we tend to look at the entire event as having been spoiled. You know, the whole thing was really terrible or the whole thing was really good, you know. <laughs> right. And it's not the case. If you look at little, you know, speckles of the day, there were parts of it that worked and parts of it that didn't. Um, and, you know, it's just a question of feedback, not a question of right and wrong. And things are either right or wrong. You know, um, well, I was wrong to do that. Well, or I was right to do that. Well, there could be different ways of looking at, looking at what occurred. You know, there's, there's, there's gray area and we don't tend to see the gray area. So we tend to cause ourselves a lot of stress over that. Yeah, it also works with food. Some people I've I've noticed some people go and try food, and they the food is either amazing or the worst. You know, <laughs> there's nowhere in between. And and the truth is, you know, like you mentioned, there are some good things about certain foods, and there are some things that are not that great. But mm -hmm. it's not it's never really black and white. You know, and mm -hmm. and that's this is something that can also affect ourselves in relationships or different things of um, doing things. So mm -hmm. uh, there's so many different things that we you know distort in our minds. Absolutely. <laughs> Like if I was to say to you, how was your vacation? You, if you would ask me, how was your vacation? How was your weekend? And I think of one event that did not go so well or something that was very disappointing, whether it was the weather or whether it was a you know, service at a restaurant or whether it was something like that, that might be stuck in my mind in terms of absolute thinking. And I might think, well, it was, you know, I might start answering your question in a negative light and then realize that 90% of it was actually quite pleasant. My weekend mm -hmm. was actually quite good. The company was good. I saw some beautiful things. I got some great relaxation. The hotel was wonderful. But we don't do that. Sometimes we either fixate on it was all great or it was, you know, or it was all bad. All bad. Um, or something small happens and then we have what's called catastrophizing where, you know, we you have the tendency to blow things and circumstances out of proportion mm -hmm. by making problems larger than they really are. And so, you know, we one tiny thing happens and then suddenly the whole trip turned into this really bad experience yeah. and we... <laughs> think that you know things are horrible in the world and that the world is coming to an end and all these different things that are just you know make things larger than life mm -hmm. and so this is this is a distortion from the mind and sometimes you know it's a tendency to to make things bigger than they really are so absolutely and you know what i did that coming into the studio today i told you a story before we started about my luggage <laughs> you know i have a tsa lock on my old luggage and the thing wouldn't open i could not i opened once and then it, i changed the code and then it got stuck and I cannot open it, so I had to return it for new luggage. So I'm starting to catastrophize. I'm starting to tell myself, well, what happens if I'm in Hawaii and I can't get my luggage open? You know, I have a boat tour leaving. I can't get to my swimwear. What happens if I am TSA wants me to open it and I can't do it? What happens if this? What happens if that? And I'm like, oh, my goodness, should I even go? You know, should I even get onto the plane? Should I even? It's just all these things start to darken the possibility of what happens from luggage that maybe gets stuck and not open. But the truth is my rational mind, if I ask my, this is how, this is the antidote, this is the way out of it, you know, if you ask your rational mind, 
uh, what, what do you think is most likely to happen here? What do you think is mo- the most likely outcome? Mm-hmm. And my rational mind will say, you're probably going to be able to get it open. And if not, you'll probably be able to call customer service, even from Hawaii, and say, can you help me open my luggage? And if not, you'll probably be able to find somebody who has a tool strong enough to pop it open. Okay, it'll be broken, but at least it'll work. And then you get back and you return it and you'll get some luggage that works and everything will be fine. And you, you get the picture. You know? <laughs> so that's my rational mind. But that's not the first thing I thought, though. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of my favorites that I've I've noticed a lot of people use, you know, especially a lot of my clients that come to see me, is overgeneralization, where they, you know, something happens to them, and then suddenly they tend to generalize that experience to every single experience they will ever have in the future. You know, they have a bad breakup, and they suddenly feel like all men or all women are going to be bad, and that from that point on, they're never going to be able to have a good relationship. Mm-hmm. And or they, you know, they have uh, some kind of problem at work, and they feel like a failure, like they can't do anything right just because they had one issue. And you know, they could have been working at the same place for ten years or five years, but then suddenly one thing that goes wrong they feel like that's it that's the end of the world and so you know we tend to do that a lot um overgeneralize our experiences and the way we think about things in life and so it's important to see things based on a single event like how things are doing in that moment and be present like we talked about before you know and and look at the evidence does it suggest that things can be different or are they just different this time or you know are they really going to be the same forever or you know if you look at life most most things are never really forever things do change the world changes all the time and and so you know overgeneralizing is really never a good thing i don't think no right and 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 something that we um overgeneralize is never a good thing because we tend to forget that there's always an exception frame you know i always ask people myself included about an exception frame when has it worked out when you say oh i never have a i never end up with a good relationship or think of your last relationship when were there moments that did work you know or i never get the job that i want think back is that true? Have you never had a job you wanted? Have you? Has there, have there been exceptions in your life? Have there been times where you have gone out and had a good time? I never this, I never that. If you think of a time when you actually have been re- reasonably content or even happy in a certain situation or with a certain outcome, you'll realize there are more exceptions to your rule than there are, than, than you would have imagined. So, um, you know, that's that's always something to to look at because that we tend to minimize. The 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 evi- the counter evidence, as we say, the counter evidence to what you're saying is true. Um, the counter evidence to the fact that you never have X Y Z. And if you look at the exceptions, you'll find that you actually you actually do more often than you realize. Mm-hmm. You know, these are all filters, I believe, that our minds use to you know sometimes for survival purposes, because you know it does help us to have some kind of idea of things, but. Really, if we we think about things, if we really use our rational mind and really try to come up with, you know, the truth, we're going to, you know, see that things are not always the same. And there's another, you know, um, cognitive distortion that's called labeling where, you know, we do have the tendency to make global statements about ourselves or others based upon a situation uh, or a specific behavior. And so we we tend to, you know, label something and say, okay, this is how it's going to be with all these types of situations. And, you know, sometimes that could be, you know, we talk about racism of, oh, you know, all Mexicans are this way or all Asians are that way or all women are going to be this way. Um, and so this type of labeling doesn't help us because, you know, not everybody's the same. Just because you're a certain race or a certain color doesn't mean that you are going to act a certain way. But, and yet sometimes people label people based on their race or based on their sex or based on their orientation or the way of, you know, their religion or there's so many different things that we can use for this uh, example. But the point is we have to look at life, you know, and what we have in front of us in the present and, and try to, you know, avoid using those filters and try to see and experience the person that we have in front of us and really, you know, be in the moment. Um, I don't know if that explains that one. Absolutely. Because I think we talked about our rational mind and our rational mind is our more of our core self, um, our more mindful self that can sort of, you know, filter um, all of these automatic thoughts 
into perspective because a lot of the time when we have these cognitive distortions or automatic thoughts, they're usually, if we pull them apart, if we set them aside for a second, if we catch ourselves doing that labeling or overgeneralizing or catastrophizing, if we put it aside for a second in our mind, we'll see that usually what's underneath is some sort of a, a core emotion, like a fear mm-hmm. or a sadness, something primal. And that something primal is stuck there in our past, frozen in time somewhere in the basement of ourselves. And it gets ignited by something. Someone has a specific behavior, so we jump, you know, we get activated. That part of us gets activated inside, that memory. And it's full of fear, full of pure emotion. So our automatic thoughts form, sort of like going up a staircase in our mind. They form in order to protect us from that feeling. So I label you or I overgeneralize about my life or my situation, or I have black and white thinking in order to protect myself to not go there again, to sort out the world so I don't get poked again, Mm -hmm. like I'm getting poked in the basement. So one way to look at, from your rational mind, what's going on here is to say, what just got activated in me when someone cut me off on the street or some, you know, a person of a certain ethnicity said something to me and I I thought that to myself or I uh, didn't have a good date. So I figure I never have good dates. Like what just happened there? What's underneath? (laughs) Yes, you do have good dates. I guarantee you, you've had, you know, um, so that, that kind of thing, looking under, like having it, pushing it aside for a moment as a part of your mind because we've talked about parts of self before and um, looking at what's underneath it, what the core emotion is, you know, and that'll give you access to where the automatic thoughts came from. And then your rational mind can say, okay, well, wait a minute. My core self, you know, doesn't necessarily have to go there. It can look at the, the emotion that got ignited and I can deal with that instead, instead of making up thoughts that are just going to lead me down, you know, a darker path, you know? Yeah. Well, another one that I I find very interesting is called shielding and musting. Uh, It's when, you know, sometimes we feel like I must do this or I should do this or that people must do this or they should do that. And so we we tend to think that, you know, people should act a certain way or that, you know, you you must do this in, in, in certain situations. And when they don't work that way, you feel this you know, anger or feeling of this, you know, frustration because things are not working out the way you expect them to work out. And the truth is there's no actual way things should be or, or work out or it must be. It Things could be anything. And there's no rule that says things should be this way or that way unless we make that in our minds. And so this is another distortion that a lot of people use that makes them unhappy a lot of times because, you know, they, they put, especially when they put unrealistic and unreasonable demands on themselves and they want to lose a lot of weight in like a week or a month or, you know, they expect, you know, to make a million dollars within six months when they've never even made a hundred thousand dollars or whatever. And so they end up failing in life and then they feel like, you know, things are not working out for them. And it's like, oh, you know, I don't understand why I'm failing or this and that. Well, you got to think, must things be this way or that way? Or is there another way to do things? You know, is there another way to to succeed in life? And and that's one thing that I feel is important to to keep in mind is there's no actual way of doing things except for what we, you know, have in our minds and the way we think that things should be. And so we if we are if we have a flexible mind and we start thinking that maybe there are other ways and that you know people can act differently that people are different than us and they're just different they're not it's not that they don't like us or that they're just hate us or that you know there's something there there could be nothing and they're just acting the way they think it's right just the way you do things and and sometimes you know the way we do things doesn't have an explanation and you just do it and so to be more present and be more aware of this is important especially when you when you look at life and you look at that you see that life is not something that you know has to be a certain way life has tons and different ways of living and and there are many many things that could happen and there's really no meaning to life you know life is meaningless unless we put the meaning to it and so what we're talking about is how we use a lot of this cognitive distortions to to shape our lives and sometimes these don't help and so we're trying to avoid this so we can live a happier life right Mm -hmm. absolutely and you know something i often tell people in terms of the shooting and musting works with a lot of clients that i speak to it's it's um uh, we just change the word should to the word could, you know, and it a- automatically opens up a great deal of, of freedom for somebody. You know, um, if you should and must, that's like shaming yourself. It's like saying criticizing yourself, judging yourself, putting a lot of pressure on yourself. And it's like shaming. It's like saying you, you, you should do this. You know, you should go to the gym. You really should because you haven't been in like a week. You really should. As opposed to you could. 
you could go to the gym today. You could also go tomorrow. You could also go the next day. So replacing, you know, should with could gives you a lot of, of, of freedom um, and takes a lot of pressure off as well. I love that. Yeah. It works a lot. People say, oh my goodness, that's such an easy reframe. I'm like, exactly. It's, it's, it, it opens up a great, great door. For yeah. A lot of reframing is important. And oh, I, yeah. I feel like, you know, it could change someone's life in, in just a, a few minutes, you know? Yeah. I read something online where some said, my kid is bossy and someone else said, no, he's just a good leader. You know, mm-hmm. they reframed it like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally cool. It's the same with, you know, I, I, one of my favorite examples uh, was from this book called um, Tribe of uh, Mentors mm-hmm. by Tim Ferriss. And there's an example of this CEO from a company who, you know, didn't want to meditate. He hated meditation. He tried it a couple times, didn't really like it. And then somebody invited him somewhere and they, you know, showed him a different way of meditating. And then he tried it and he said at that point he 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 saw that it was, you know, he didn't see it as meditation anymore. It was more like a reframing of the mind. And he started thinking differently about it. And he took it more as a, as a way of, you know, uh, learning how to control yourself Mm -hmm. and how to find uh, discipline and and self-control. And at that point he realized, you know, he was a CEO from a company that had thousands of um, employees, but he couldn't even sit for 10, 15 minutes. So he was like thinking, if I can't even sit for 10, 15 minutes, how am I ever going to be able to control thousands of people, you know? <laughs> so that reframing made him want to meditate more and start, you know, trying new things. And I feel like that's really important. Absolutely. It's really not that hard to do. It's just looking at, uh, you know, d- different word, really, a different way of shaping around your, your thought process. Mm-hmm. And there's another one called emotional reasoning. This one's um, pretty potent because um, the tendency to interpret your experience based upon how you're feeling in the moment. So, um, yeah, therefore, how we feel about something effectively shapes how we perceive and interpret the situation you find yourself in. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're feeling if you're feeling sad and something dark happens, it's it's going to be further enhanced. You know, you're just going to interpret a situation based on how you're already feeling. Somebody, um, you, know, you show up at a store and they didn't have what you wanted. You know, if you're already feeling upset, you know, you're going to interpret it based on that emotion that you're already walking in with. You're already walking with a certain amount of armor, so you're going to enhance, you know, maximize that uh, that emotional. Um, um, atmosphere that you have as opposed to another possibility it could just be that you know but if you walked in all happy and elated and in a joyful mood and you prepared yourself for that and someone was out of it you're like oh that's okay it's an opportunity for me to try something different you know but it depends on what emotional you know atmosphere you're walking in with and what emotional um mood you're walking in with it says our emotions therefore effectively become a barometer for how we view our life and circumstances in order to successfully work through the cognitive distortion question whether your emotional state of mind is preventing you from seeing things clearly so that's the important question what evidence suggests that how i'm seeing this isn't is not accurate um if ever you're looking at a situation and you're, you're automatically assuming something about it how is it not accurate? What's the counter, again, what's the counter evidence to what I'm assuming is true here? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is important when it comes to uh, relationships as well. You know, if you're, oh, yeah. you're feeling depressed and, you know, you just came out of a relationship and then you go on a date feeling like that, your chances of actually seeing what you have in front of you with that new person are going to be very, very small because you're mm-hmm. not going to be fully there. You're going to be thinking of, you know, whatever the other person did to you. And so it's going to be harder to to really be, see, look at the evidence that you have in front of you and, and be more accurate about it and to know if, if you actually like that new person or not, you know, without the emotional baggage. Yeah, a good example of that would be what they call the rebound. Right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. a rebound. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a pop-culturalized word to mean emotional reasoning, you know, you're... You're, you're already colored with a certain emotion or a set of emotions you're coming into a situation and you're picking up vibe from somebody else who's coming from a certain emotional emotional place as well. So Right. Yeah. Another one that is also very common is magnification and minimization, 
which is the tendency to magnify the positive attributes of another while minimizing our own. You know, we look at someone and we, we, we feel like, you know, we're not deserving or capable of doing things, but they are. And we think that, you know, because they're attractive, they could be, you know, we give them attributes or we think that they're Superman or Superwoman and they can do almost anything, but we can't because, you know, they're perfect and we're not and they're beautiful and we're ugly. And mm-hmm. so we tend to, you know, give all this attributes that are false and lose ourselves in that relationship because we're not looking at at the at the evidence of the the, the truth that we also have good attributes and good things and positive things that, that you know can give something to the other person and yet we are not we're ignoring those things and we're humiliating ourselves because we think that you know the other person has more power than we do you know mag- magnification and minimization is to me almost the antithesis of of intimacy it's when you're with somebody and you're listening to, um, watching them, and you're uh, blowing them out of proportion and blowing yourself under proportion, so to speak. Once you get to know somebody, once you get to connect with somebody and connect with other human beings, you begin to realize there is less difference between us than you would imagine, and that everybody has a story and everybody has uh, struggles underneath and fears underneath and that nobody is as magnified as you're making them and you're not as minimized as you're making yourself. There's a certain leveling of connection that happens when you become intimate with somebody else and you really get to know other people, allow yourself to be vulnerable and see their vulnerabilities. You begin to realize that even if they seem to have more than you do, the truth is they've been through very, very similar human struggles and what's, what they seem to have on the outside you know, may be different. But what's going on on the inside is very, very similar so that we can, we can um, level the playing fields by getting close, by actually uh, creating intimacy. That's right. Yeah. yeah. The, one of the things that I feel is important with all these cognitive distortions is to look at the present, look at the evidence and what you have in front of you and try to, you know, think uh, clearly with those things. It's, I know it's it's hard because a lot of times we're living in our heads and we're constantly thinking and creating, you know, movies in our mind about things. Especially when it comes to relationships and love, we we tend to you know give more to the other person and and we give less to ourselves, or we tend to live in this fantasy world. You know, that's one of the the love types that maybe we can talk about in the future. But mm-hmm. one of them is living in a fantasy where you feel like you have a prince or a princess and and you you know deserve all these things and or that you don't deserve those things but the other person does and and there's all this cognitive distortions in our minds of things how things should be or must be but when they're not like that you know because we we watch a lot of movies about love and Mm -hmm. and relationships but sometimes movies are not the same thing as real life real life can be different real life can be you know harsh can be empty can be a lot of different things and so one of my favorite examples is you know I, i love to travel and when you look at things on tv or or movies they usually tend to put the best images mm-hmm. on on the on the movie or of the place or you know like you look at vegas you know and and they, they show you the strip and they show you all these amazing things happening but then when you actually go to vegas there's smells and then there's thousands of people that walk on the streets and it's hot it's sometimes it's dry sometimes it's humid uh, you know, it's a lot of loud noises. There, you know, there are more things than just the strip to Vegas. There are some really bad areas in <laughs> Vegas, and there are some really cool areas as well that you know nobody ever sees in the movies. And so, seeing a place for for what it is, looking at the evidence, is very different than you know the way we think about it. Yeah, you could see a a, a pair of luggage online too. It looks wonderful <laughs> too, and it arrives and you saw it totally different. Yeah, I was thinking about that when you talk about Vegas. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's 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 um yeah that's the, a big thing actually is that people when it comes to love and romance or work relation work uh, and success they have it in their mind the way things should look a fantasy like you said the picture perfect way it's supposed to go it becomes a goal and the goal becomes calcified crystallized inside their mind it becomes very difficult different difficult to change that view of what the future should look like in terms of relationship love work success and um. One of the reasons that it's so hard to change it is because there's such a fear underneath of change. You know, we want certainty. And we've been living with that certainty for so long that, um, you know, it's very difficult for us to, um, like for the first time in my life, when my friend showed me around San Diego, I was like, you know what? This is a wonderful city. I'd never thought, I've heard of it, 
Mm-hmm. Of course, I've been here. <laughs> and then people said, where are you going to buy? Where are you going to buy a house? I'm like, I never thought of San Diego. But one weekend, I allowed myself to be in the here and now. I saw my automatic thoughts coming up saying, no, 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 we're buying you know, at location X. That's what we're saving for. And I'm like, but wait a second, there's location Y and why not? You know, so I was like, this is really nice. So I it just, it's, it's really hard to get our crystallized, you know, um, fantasies or crystallized hopes or what we think is supposed to be picture perfect to change. It's a lot of fear involved in that. You know, when people lose their certain structures, why do people are so structured sometimes when they lose that structure, they get very, there's a lot of anxiety that comes up around that. But um, again, I think it's important to be with um, the younger parts of self that are getting activated when that happens. You know, when I'm changing my mind, ooh, I get scared. <laughs> you know, because when I was a kid, things changed suddenly um, a lot of the times and uh, things were unpredictable. So I remember that feeling and I don't want that feeling again. So I say, okay, we're moving here. So here's my goal plan. And then if it suddenly changes, for me, I get you know, a certain activation level, but I recognize it. I'm like, wait a second, that's not, that's just your self getting activated. But this is a perfectly good, you know, um, left turn. So, yeah, and that all gets held into place by automatic thoughts and cognitive distortions, mental filtering, emotional reasoning, overgeneralization, maximization and minimization, personalization, taking everything personally. That's the way it keeps all that in, in place, our core beliefs about life. Oh, did we talk about that one? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so we're just going to summarize all of them real quick. All um, right. So the first one was mental filtering, jumping to conclusions, mm-hmm. red personalization, black and white thinking, catastrophizing, overgeneralization, labeling, shouldn't and musting, emotional reasoning, and magnification and minimization. Mm-hmm. These are just some that are, you know, we find, found that were most important to talk about, but there mm-hmm. are a lot more. And oh, yeah. We certainly, you know... Um, have a lot of filtering that we use in order to survive like i said but sometimes those filters don't work in the present anymore and we need to come to the present and look at our life the way it is now and you know hopefully you get something out of this and just at least become more aware of this you know cognitive distortions happening most of the time Mm -hmm. a lot of times this is what the reason why we sabotage ourselves and we end up you know in, in situations where we're not happy and simply by noticing these things can change a lot of things in our lives. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioned, sometimes they, there are things that trigger us. There are people that trigger us. And, and we just never know where it's going to come from. But if we are aware of them, then it's easier to to catch them and to catch ourselves, you know, d- dwelling in the past or, you know, changing our reality and not looking at things as they are and looking at the evidence and noticing that, you know, not everything is going to be perfect all the time. But it's okay, you know, it's okay that things are not going to be perfect. And it's okay to look at look at the things that we have in front of ourselves and really, you know, um, try to, to look at the facts, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, right. Right. Um, and, you know, and it's important to remember that thoughts, automatic thoughts, lead to feelings, mm-hmm. you know, and feelings lead to actions and behaviors, what we're going to do about those feelings, which lead to outcomes, which lead to further evidence that... You know, our core belief about whatever the automatic thoughts were spawned from are, are true. So it's like a cycle. It's like a loop. It's important to remember. And one um, uh, one uh, distortion that wasn't really on here that I think is very common also is that people tend to look at the one little spot on the wall, you know, a perfectly white wall. They see one little spot and they, and they focus on that spot. Like if they give it a performance and they flub at the beginning of the performance. They make, you know, uh, they say something wrong at the beginning. So, oh, sorry, that was wrong. And they go back. That's the whole performance. The whole right. performance is gone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like on this, if I drop something and it makes a sound, oops, horrible podcast today because we just dropped something. You know, like that's what people do is we focus on that one little thing that went wrong and we say the whole thing was no good. You know, the stain on the wall, the blemish on the face, you know, the face is no good because of that one little blemish. Um, and that's a cognitive distortion, you know, and that's a very common one also. So, um, yeah, it's just, and then it causes feelings. Ugh, I'm terrible at this, <laughs> you know, and then what do you do? Well, do you, you go in with less confidence next time. If you go in with less confidence, what tends to happen? You'll get another blemish. You'll get, you know, and then you'll just prove to yourself that you're just no, no good at something. It's not true. It's just not true at all. You are good at something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It happens all the time. But mm-hmm. thank you so much, Neil, for your time. I think uh, we're running out of time now. So any last words before we end this podcast? Um, just remember that likely what you're thinking is automatic 
and take a look at your thoughts and remember your rational mind, ask your rational mind the question, what's a more likely outcome? What do I think is really going on here? Do I really think that that's the truth? And just check in with yourself. Always check in. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And we will see you next week on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Remember, this podcast is MindFit, and we are on all the platforms now available for you to listen to us. And if you have any comments or anything you like to tell us or ask us, please send them our way. We have a Facebook account. We have an Instagram. And we have a Twitter account as well. So please send us your messages. And thank you so much. Again, this is Robert Aceves, and this is Neil Babbins. We'll see you next week. See you next week. This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast, or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call us directly at 714-328-4661.